New trends such as consumers becoming producers and open innovation affect the dynamics in markets around the globe. Regulators and market authorities need to take a moment and reflect on their current course of action. Are they still equipped with the right tools to operate effectively amidst these changes? The best innovation according to our next speaker, the pencil. Friday afternoon, so uh, I'll try and in get. When do Holland next play football? Is it Monday. soon? Monday. Oh, you've got an entire weekend to to look forward to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look, I'll show you. I'll, just to introduce myself, I'll show you. I'll show you where I come from. Uh, this is home. Um, obviously, this is this is my family um, getting ready to play cricket. Um, the reason we invented cricket was uh, so we've got something to do when we get knocked out of the World Cup. Um, and uh, I'm I'm an Arsenal season ticket holder, so I've got three season tickets at Arsenal. That's like having a second mortgage. You could buy a house in The Hague for that. Um, but I know what it's like to have my entire being depend on the state of Robin Van Persie's knee. It's an incredibly fragile thing. Um, so my heart goes out to you. There we are, getting ready for dinner. Um, so I don't know why you've invited someone from England to come and talk to you about the future. Um, <laughs> LAUGHTER Because um, the German poet Henrik Heine when asked where he wanted to die, said he'd like to die in England because everything there happens 100 years late. Um, <laughs> so anyway, with that in mind, I'll try and talk a little bit and perhaps pick up some of the questions, the really good questions that uh, Annette uh, left us with and think about what it would be like if you wanted to be a really transformational, innovative regulator. Um, and so, as Annette said, really, I mean, that all of that was really that every business on that slide is looking for a business model. I mean, actually, I think Google probably has a business model. Twitter doesn't have a business model. Facebook probably has a business model. Apple certainly has a business model at the moment. But many of the other new media companies don't have business models. Amazon does, probably. Um, but many of the old media companies are looking for business models, basically. When I joined Germany, Journalism. I went to the FT. I can remember when I was interviewed at the FT. I can remember none of the questions that I was asked, but I do know that I wasn't asked, what's your business model? Um, no one asked me, how will your readers use what you write, or how will you interact with them, and how will you share your information? And when you find out that what you write is virtually worthless, because it can be copied for free, what else will you do? No one asked me that. But actually, now in journalism and in all media production companies, everyone is searching for a business model. Everyone, new and old, public and private. And it's not just there that people are searching for business models. If you think about health, health is searching for huge business models. All of the pharmaceutical industry is now searching for a different business model because the way that they developed antibiotic drugs isn't the way of the future with genomics and other things, but actually public health systems are searching for business models, the energy market. There are industries that should be searching for business models but don't do it hard enough, banking. We need an entirely new business model in much of banking, it seems to me, um, and they should be searching for different business models the recession that we've emerging from slowly produced by business models were completely flawed, built on the absolutely avaricious exploitation of asymmetries of relationship between bankers and their customers often. So wherever you go, I think, public and private, people are searching for business models. And they're, they're doing that because you get this combination of disruptive forces, um, which then you know, for a time you look at from a position of an incumbent, you say, yeah, that's not really doing very much in any way we do this, don't we? Suddenly they overtake you, by which time it's too late to respond. Um, and then you get the creation of new value in new places and new monopolies emerge, um, combined with changing needs 
changing needs of an older population, the changing demands of climate, of rising inequality, of a more global world, of more conflict in ways, so on and so forth. And so we live, as, as Annette said, in this world where we get two different kinds of asymmetries at the same time. We get the asymmetry of huge monopolies, which now know more about us and have more insight into our lives than any media baron of old. I mean, Rupert Murdoch paid people to hack phones to get information that we freely give to Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, we give... I mean, Rupert Murdoch shut the news of the world because his journalists were illegally getting the kind of information that actually we hand over all the time to Mark Zuckerberg. So this is a world where, you know, there's an asymmetry because a group of 7,000 jihadists can rewrite the map of the Middle East coming from nowhere. So there's that kind of asymmetry where the small can suddenly be huge and have disruptive effects precisely because of the network effects that Annette is talking about. And simultaneously, we live in a world where there are even bigger monopolies and we're sort of caught between because, I mean, Bill talked about the mobile phone earlier. And it was very interesting the way he talked about it, I thought, because it, there is a really interesting thing which is about how you describe things and the language that you use. And the trap, inadvertently, of using language which takes you back to a kind of paradigm which doesn't really help you think about the future. Because the thing about these things is... Who here has got an Apple product? So most of the room has got an Apple product. I'm not going to do the really embarrassing thing and ask, but let's do it. Who here has got more than five Apple products in their house? <laughs> Quite a lot of people. Quite a lot of people. I won't, anyone got more than eight in their house? <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, no, there's definitely some, some back there. I mean, what happens with these, of course, is that these are beautiful objects, aren't they? Um, and when I go into the Apple store, these start talking to me. Um, and what, what this says is, you may be bald, middle-aged and overweight, but if you buy me, you'll feel cool. And, <laughs> and each, time, each time it says that to me, I think, oh, fantastic, I'll get it. Um, and then you, then you open it up, and with the ecosystem of the apps, which... Apple doesn't initially understand it's created by hackers who alert it to the possibility of this entire new value domain. Um, with the ecosystem, the apps, this becomes an amazing tool, doesn't it? With just two buttons, um, you can do virtually anything with it. So one way of thinking about this is the sort of framework of the technology as a tool. And what does that invite you to think? That invites you to think that we're in control because a tool is something like a kind of chisel or a hammer that's an extension of you, you form an intention, you use it and achieve something. Now, and we do that with this. But this is also a phone and a camera and all the rest of it. It's also a tracking device. And basically, the point about this is that this isn't just for us, we are for it. Because actually, we live our lives through all the frameworks, apps, data, status updates and all the rest of it that this now provides for us. So there is that sort of I'm just guessing, but I bet everyone in this room has had that feeling. When the bars disappear, and you say, have you got signal? Have you got signal? Has anyone got signal? You can get signal over there. Let's go and get signal. And it's like, oh, I've been brought back to life, resuscitated, because <laughs> the signal has blessed me. It's come back. I now have signal. And then when, when I remember going on this walk with my son in the, in the Lake District and sort of coming down, the, coming down from the mountain, and my phone, which I'd left in my pocket, coming back to life and bleeping. And that mixture of relief, oh, I've got a signal, and sadness, oh, I've got a signal. Meaning that I was back on the system, that the, the system kind of alerted me. So the question about this is, is this technology as tool or is this technology as water? As Cass Sunstein put it today, this is water now. This is what we swim in. We swim in Apple. And this isn't just for us, we are for it. We are now, as with all technologies, including the pencil, including the book, including the typewriter, actually we frame ourselves through this. What's the implication of that? Well, the implication is the idea of the independent consumer, whether rational, nudgeable or irrational, 
is a kind of outdated notion. Because now all consumers come entangled by social networks and the kind of frameworks that we live within. So if you operate in that kind of world, if you live in that kind of world, um, this sort of blizzard, fog of new things, old things getting bigger, merging, um, new things emerging that seem great, but then also seem perhaps a little bit evil. Let's just do a little test. Who here is on Facebook? So quite a lot of, but not much, there's a really hardcore group over here, and not, <laughs> not on Facebook. Of the people who are on Facebook, how many people trust Facebook? <laughs> yeah, not, so not a single person who's on Facebook trusts it. Therein lies our dilemma. That blue expanse over the world, I bet that's probably true of that group. That all, you, you had that kind of delineation, didn't you, of those thirds. But there is a kind of issue, which is you've got no option now but not to be part of it, but do you really fundamentally trust it? So if you're in that kind of position, um, my one piece of advice about innovation is that innovation involves all sorts of things. Um, it requires enormous persistence because you never get it right first time. Um, it, persistence matters because it involves timing, usually, because you can be way too early and way too late. And one of the things that Steve Jobs was really brilliant at was arriving just at the right moment, often slightly late. He, his best innovations arrived after other people had started developing the market and developing the ecosystem, and then he came in with a much better product. Timing is critical. Memory is critical, actually, because it turns out many of the best ideas are old ideas that are brought back to life and reinvented in some kind of new way. But the most important thing is perspective. If you start by looking in the wrong way, from the wrong place, in the wrong direction, you won't get anything useful. If you start by asking the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer. And if you ask, we've got this books business, how do we sell more books? You'll end up trying to sell discounted books at large numbers. If you ask, what is it that people will want to read in future and how will they want to read it? It might lead you in a different direction. So having a perspective is critical, and particularly now in this fog, because actually the most interesting thing might be over here or over there, and you need to be able to look both from the future, but also from uh, the past. You need to be able to kind of look in many different directions. So one of the first things about perspective is not getting trapped, not getting trapped in the silos of we are a regulator and we regulate this, and this is our constituency and we look at it in this way. Any organisation with the words authority and market in its title needs a new business model. <laughs> Honestly, because both those words are deeply problematic, aren't they? All around us, authority is being remade. Where is authority? Who has it? How do they exercise it? On what basis? All the doubts about markets and whether they work and um, disequilibrium effects and so on and so forth. So to pledge yourself, we are the market's authority, means that you have to open up these questions and you have to look around. But the most important thing about perspective is that you need to know what you stand for. Because if you don't know what you stand for, you won't know what matters. And then in this blizzard of stuff coming at you, mobile, cloud, big data, all of it designed to confuse you, by the way, and to kind of make you think that the technology companies know the future in a way that they definitely don't, because none of them really know what big data is for, no one of them really know what the quantified, quantified self is for. But in this blizzard, to know what matters, you have to know what you stand for. And to know what you stand for, you have to know who you stand for and what it is that, about their lives that you stand for. So you have to have a purpose. And you have to be prepared to ask questions which seem sort of mad or which open things up in kind of unusual ways and which you're prepared to sort of ask, why couldn't we do it this way? in a way that unlocks new values. So I'll show you someone who did that. There we are. Here he is, the genius, who asked this amazing question, helped actually probably by an English renegade football coach, Vic Buckingham, but um, who asked the question, sort of, you know, football was played this sort of English way, the English way that we still play football, which is that actually not all the players on the field can play football, it turns out, because the people at the back are just good at tackling and then sort of booting the ball upfield to the players at the front who sort of never kind of really track back and they kind of dribble, but then they get tired, they have to have a rest or something like that. And um, it 
was built on a sort of class system of sort of defenders at the back and attackers at the front who were sort of creative artists um, and probably used hairspray and stuff like that. <laughs> and then Johann Cruyff came along and asked a different question. And his question was, what if all 11 players could actually play football? What if all 11 could play football and they could move and pass and play at different angles and interchange positions? Then you get this sort of collaborative creativity. And so what he did was take a different perspective to stand for something different. And that innovation, that idea of total football, then iterated and changed and developed over many, many years. So in other words, if you want to be an innov innovator in a radical way, you have to, first of all, think about your perspective, both where you're going to look, but also critically what you stand for. And so you have to think about what kind of innovation you want. And this is a very, very simple kind of crude grid to think about it. So all this says is that there are two basic kinds of innovation. There's sustaining innovation to sustain an existing business model. And there's disruptive innovation to disrupt it, to find a different way to do it, or maybe a different way to do a different thing. And then there are traditional kind of familiar places where you might do that inside institutions. And then there are unfamiliar places which are outside established networks or institutions. And most of the time, in most organizations, we're trying to do this. We're trying to improve what we've got. Um, we have established processes, um, uh, customer relationships, channels, uh, buildings, equipment, people. Let's just get a bit more out of them and improve them. And so a lot of what Cass was talking about this morning, nudging, it seems to me is much better ways to do this. If only we could just do what we already do much better, then actually we'd be in a much better position. And so, you know, if only the banking system could... Um, be encouraged to let people know about overdrafts, mortgage, savings, debt in new and much more informed and encouraging ways, which encourage responsibility, saving and good management, then actually we'd have a much, much better banking system. And it's not rocket science. It's lots of rather simple things uh, which aren't technological at all. So that's one version. Uh, the second is you might want to reinvent what you do. So I'm still a bank or I'm still a telecoms regulator, but I'm going to try and do that in some new kind of way. And I'm going to find a new way to do it. So in a, a bank, it might be to become a telephone based bank or to redesign my uh, products so that there are no overdrafts or it might be to redesign my, uh, my stores. A, th a third approach is to say, no, no, actually, the best way to innovate is to combine what I do with what other people do. And if you can bring these two together, so often you find through mergers of the kind Annette was talking about or mergers of the kind that Bill was talking about, actually, if we can bring two different things together, Nike with a running thing with an app and a wristband becomes a kind of way to kind of you know, manage your own health, then you create a new product. There is a kind of regulator version of this, which you're going through, I guess, which is let's bring lots of things together and that's a new thing. And the problem with that, I'll tell you the problem with that, is that the public sector loves to do that. Um, we in the public sector love to do that. We'll merge housing with health and social care and call it adult services. It's a new thing. <laughs> and for the consumer, it's like it's government. That's, you know, that's all they see, basically. We think it's radical because we've reorganized our offices and where we sit, but actually from the point of view of the citizen or the consumer, it's just the same old story, your government. So there is a danger with this, that it can be creative, but it can also lead to a dead end. And then finally down here, there's sort of transformational innovation. Transformational innovation is not just to find a new way to do it, Ryanair remaking low-cost airlines or Southwest Airlines more likely, but a new way to do a new thing. I remember the first time I ever saw anyone using a, um, a Sony Walkman and my jaw just dropped when he rode past me at university because the thought that you could listen to music on the move had never struck me at all. And this was a sort of transformational thing because it opened up a whole new domain of experience, whereas music you had to listen to in a fixed place, you could now listen to on the move. Um, and so transformational because it had seen itself from outside. So all of these different approaches to innovation require different kinds of skills. And I suppose one of the challenges for innovators, which I think Annette was leaving us with, 
was where in this board would you like to put your pieces? Because you cannot get out of the top left-hand corner. You cannot give up on improving what is there. But if we think that actually the big gains of the future are going to come down towards the bottom right-hand corner, because we're going to create new energy systems, new health systems, new communication systems, new retail platforms down there, how do you regulate for that? And if you're a regulator, what would it be like to be yourself a transformational innovator, not just an improver? And could you conceive of what that might be like? And what might it take to do that? Well, it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because we live, one of the products of the world that Annette and others have described today is this sort of oxymoron character. Oxymoron is a British word, it's an English word, which means uh, something that sounds impossible, a sort of contradiction in terms. So Cass was talking, Cass's book, Nudge, is a sort of oxymoron book, liberal paternalism. That's why it captured the spirit of the age, because it was this combination of things that shouldn't really go together. And so I think one of the themes of the world that we live in is that we have a sort of centralised decentralisation that we have a centralization of money, power, and influence in people like Facebook and Google, allowing this radical decentralization of opportunity, markets, niches, and so on and so forth going on at the same time. Or if you want to take it a little bit further, we have sort of creativity as uniform. When you're in London at the moment, creativity is so everywhere, everyone wants to be creative, it's the kind of new uniform. Or diversity as the new standard or Cass's kind of view of the world, directed self-direction. So we can't really allow you to direct yourself, so we're going to sort of subtly direct you so that what you do, you make choices, but we make sure that they're the right choices. Um, and so that's kind of an old-fashioned technique of government called ruling through freedom, which actually, if you read Michel Foucault, that's Foucault's view of the world, which is actually the most powerful forms of discipline are the ways we, we encourage ourselves to discipline ourselves, we govern ourselves in ways that appear to be free but aren't free. So we're in this world of oxymorons. And so if you were to be a transformational regulator, I mean, regulation has a sort of sense that it should be about steadiness. Regulating is to sort of manage and control. But say you were regulating for transformation. Say in health, I don't, you're not a health regulator, but just imagine it or a little bit. But say in health, the big challenge in health is we've got dramatic new developments in uh, the treatment of disease, completely new ways of doing surgery, which mean that treatment in hospital can both be more complicated and more costly and more effective. At the same time, we've got ageing populations with long-term long conditions around diabetes and other things which are not best treated in hospital. And we've got unsustainable health spending in most of the developed world. So what we need is a transformation in health systems towards systems that are more decentralised, more preventative, more about lifestyle and do more stuff out there and less stuff in hospital. If the regulators in health think their job is to set the right tariff for hernia operations, that is not helping society find a better way to use its resources to manage its health. But what would the role of a regulator be in helping that transition to a different kind of system? What would you look at? Well, the danger is this. So Bill talked about McDonnell Douglas this morning. This is a way of thinking about it. This is the, the DC-3. It was absolutely the workhorse of the civil aircraft industry up to the 50s. It was a brilliant plane. And uh, in the last sort of 15 years of its life, engineers worked incredibly hard to optimise its performance, to get it fly longer, uh, further, carry more, to improve it, so on and so forth. But actually, what was waiting in the wings, of course, was this, the Boeing 707. But what stopped these people moving from this suboptimal solution to this was not a nudge, it was a cartel of fear, which was that no one was prepared to make the shift to this kind of way of doing it. And why? Because actually of some of the ecosystem effects that Annette was talking about, which is that these planes require different business models. 
These planes can fly higher, longer, further. They need larger runways. They need a different infrastructure at the end. They need a completely different system. So if the job is to try and help people shift from one system to another to find better systems, not just better products, but better systems, what's the job of a regulator in allowing that kind of systems innovation? If systems are the most powerful innovations, not products and services, and systems are made up of multiple players, not just single companies, but entire sets of companies, some competing, some supplying, how do you regulate for that? Does anyone know who this guy is? Has anyone... This guy has changed every life in this room. Uh, he will have touched everyone in this room. Everyone in this room will use something that this guy made possible. And he has had as big an impact in many ways on the world economy as Steve Jobs or uh, Bill Gates. His name is Malcolm McLean. And the reason that he deserves to be famous is that in 1956, he sailed this boat into uh, Houston, into uh, Newark. And on it, the Ideal X, a reconstituted Second World War tanker, was the first commercial containers ever carried by uh, a ship. And his name, Malcolm McLean, he was a trucker. And he had a problem, which is getting his goods from south to north was extremely expensive. It was wrapped up in regulation. Uh, the roads were congested. Truckers couldn't move into the shipping business. And so he thought, well, maybe I could put my trucks onto a boat. And he tried that. That didn't work. So then he got a guy called Bruce Tatlinger, who was working in Alaska and making containers there to come. And they knocked up the first containers in his backyard and put them on this boat, cut down two second-hand cranes from uh, disused shipyards, put them at either end, and that was the first container. Absolutely revolutionary, because even on this first voyage, it was clear that there was a dramatic drop in transport costs, because it cut out so much of the complexity involved in the system. First 10 years, it was like one of Annette's diagrams, first 10 years got absolutely nowhere made absolutely no dent on the incumbent industry. It was only when a second and then a third wave of innovators came in and they started building larger ports, bigger cranes, bigger boats. They standardized the industry. There was regulation to break up the obstacles. There was regulation to help standardize the containers. There were new regulations to allow all new forms of insurance and so on and so forth that you then got to this. And this is the revolution that he started off. So my question is, how do you spot Malcolm McLean? Because if Malcolm McLean is going to generate huge economic value, how do you stop Malcolm McLean being bought up and run out of business by Facebook or Microsoft, or just being denied access to the market? That's our question. How do we get more Malcolm McLeans? And when we get them, how can we help them build these new systems which challenge existing systems? So if that's the, the kind of change that we need, and seeing, if you like, regulation as a kind of form of public leadership in that sense, not simply as a kind of job to kind of tweak and kind of tone up an existing market, but to try and lead society to find better solutions, how would you do it? Let me just give you four ideas, three ideas. The first is that you would have to get used to looking in margins. If you just focus on the biggest players, you will s not spot some of the most important radical innovations. Most of the most radical innovations start in marginal markets. They do not start with incumbent companies for all sorts of very good reasons that Clayton Christensen and others have looked at. So when you say, as you do often, we are an oversight authority, I think that's great, but you should also be an undersight authority. Because literally, you will not spot what's coming unless you get underneath things as well as on top of things. Because if you're just looking from up here, you won't be alert to the people who are trying to do new things that are coming. Because actually, you need to get down to find them. So this is the mountain bike. I can remember when there were no mountain bikes. I can remember when there were just Eddie Merck's racing bikes and the sort of dad bikes that 
my dad used to ride to go to the allotment. And then in the UK, there was this sort of bike called the chopper, which had this sort of handlebars like that. But you were definitely not allowed that. And you could look at it through the bike shop window. But that was as close to a chopper as you would get. Um, and then in the mid 70s, this bike came along, the mountain bike. Where did it come from? Well, it came from avid bike consumers who were not being served by bike manufacturers. They were happy making their bikes. And so these bike consumers started putting together the frames of the old bikes and gears from racing bikes and bits of motorcycles. And for the first 10 years, the mountain bike was known as a clunker. And it was built in people's garages. And it was only then that Marin became the first commercial bike manufacturer. And now, of course, the Taiwanese dominate that market. Mountain bikes now account for 65% of bike sales in America, a category entirely created by consumers working in margins with no resources. So that is not a story that particularly required much regulation. But actually, if we want to encourage people like that, we have to encourage those kinds of spaces. And if those kinds of spaces can't get access to markets and capital and to build, they can't create the new products, services, and systems of the future. The second thing is that you have to get used to challenging orthodoxy. Um, and you have to get used to standing on the side of people who are likely to be thought mad, possibly bad, um, certainly, they will. all the incumbent interests that they challenge will try and undermine them, denigrate them, tell you that they're going to ruin everything, so on and so forth. So you have to be prepared to stand with people who will challenge orthodoxy. And that is an extremely painful, conflict-ridden kind of activity. Innovation does not come without conflict. And it also comes from people who will come from unusual spaces. So they will not come looking like we look. They will not come wearing suits. They will come probably looking slightly different. So do you have these bags of salad in Holland? So I remember when salad, do you remember the iceberg lettuce? So the iceberg lettuce, kind of crunch, completely tasteless, but very crunchy. Um, the iceberg lettuce, I think, has been largely kind of um, disintermediated, I suppose, or reintermediated by these bags of lettuce. And now the British, I remember when salad in Britain, it was something you had, roughly speaking, for about three weeks in July. And it was a sort of limp lettuce with some tomato and some salad cream and probably a boiled egg. Um, and now you can buy these bags of lettuce, loose leaf lettuce. You open the bag and you sprinkle it. Where did that idea come from? Who thought up that idea? It didn't come from a big retailer. It didn't come from a big food manufacturer. Actually, it came from here. It came from 25 acres of land in Carmel, California. And it came from two graduate students, Drew and Myra Goldman, who hired, rented this land to grow vegetables and salad and fruit for themselves. They supplied a local chef. The chef changed, a uh, different chef at the restaurant. New chef didn't want their lettuce. They were left with all this unsold lettuce. Myra had found that if you put the lettuce in a freezer bag and put the freezer bag in the fridge, then you could pick lettuce on a Friday, and in the following Wednesday, it was still fresh. So she said, why don't we just get more freezer bags and put more, more lettuce in freezer bags, and we'll take it to local shops and see if they want to sell it. And none of it came back. So they got three more farms. And then the first shop that really sold it was this shop on the edge of the road in Carmel, California, which uh, was the earthbound farm store. Then what happened was that Costco came to them and said, we really like your lettuce. By this stage, they'd invested a huge amount in learning how to create this new product, and entirely organic. Um, Myra's, just one example, Myra's father, as a sort of engineer, took a washing machine and sort of switched its delicate cycle so you could wash the lettuce on a delicate cycle. That's how you get washed lettuce. It's lettuce washed in a washing machine on a delicate cycle that's been adapted. 
Costco came to them and said, we like it, and they took it to scale, changed the market. Organic food, now the fastest growing segment of food in the US, one of the places it started was there. Drew and Myra Goldman now have 137 farms, and they look like this, <laughs> which is kind of, you know, beautiful and ethical and horribly rich all at the same time. <laughs> um, But the final thing I would say, I suppose, is that all these models that we're talking about, uh, the how you change consumer culture is going to be one of the most important things. And so one of the challenges would be all the big changes that I see in health, in politics, have an element of cultural change about them. So they are about, if you like, building movements of consumers and or movements of citizens, people who can enact change in their lives, if you like. So the biggest power, disruptive power, in society in many ways, is the dispersion of power into the hands of people who now think they can do things themselves and through platforms bring about change where they can either provide for themselves or challenge other people to do a better job. Uber, Annette mentioned, how has TripAdvisor changed the entire travel industry? It's just an incredibly simple thing. It's changed, it's been the most important force, I think, for consumer voice in the travel industry that there is. And you now go and you see absolutely regularly number, you know, number one on TripAdvisor, so on and so forth. So what if your job was not to regulate markets, but to create more TripAdvisors? What if your job is not to act for consumers, but to enable, encourage, and stimulate consumers to do a better job for themselves, to actually use the power of social media and other tools like that to create a different way to do things, to create more trip advisors? What if your job was to stimulate frustration? Actually, the biggest problem with consumer markets is that consumers are complacent. What if your job was to make them frustrated and to aspire for more and to have more tools in their control? So this, these people understand that. These people understand perfectly that because this is water. This is not a running shoe, this is water. Because these people have become successful because they understood that they were selling not shoes but an ideology. And the ideology is just do it. You can do it with a bit of determination, will and talent, you can just do it. The reason that Adidas is not selling as many shoes as these people is that Adidas thinks it's selling shoes and it wants to make better shoes endorsed by more celebrities sold in better locations. Actually, what these people are selling is a kind of way of life and an experience. They're selling water. They're selling an environment. If you really want to mobilize consumers, you have to kind of somehow tap into that, that you're trying to build a movement for consumer change and to build more capable, more challenging, more assertive kinds of consumers. So I think if you want to think of your job as being not regulators, but public leaders. We're trying to lead a society to find better solutions, mobilizing the power of consumers to demand and create more. Then you have to, in, you have to think of yourselves not just as experts sitting above, but as mobilizers as well, investing in change or finding the spaces where that will happen. And some of that is going to be about challenging power. There, um, so most, uh, I think, what Cass was saying about nudging is great, but actually you won't do anything about obesity until you challenge the big food companies and you're prepared to take on sugar and salt and the way that they sell food, and that's about challenging power. It's about opening up space for new entrants. It's about having public alternatives. It's about giving people lots of really useful information from people they trust who tend to be people like them, and it's about creating a whole set of things that might come together to propel change. And so it's sort of regulation as kind of public leadership, if you like. So if you want to think that your job, I think, should be helping society develop better systems, better ways of solving its biggest challenges, how would you do that? I'll just leave you with this one example. So if you want, what one of the biggest 
clearest, I think, uh, achievements of public policy uh, over the last sort of 15 years is the dramatic fall in the number of people who die through domestic fires. It's absolutely clear there's been this dramatic fall in the number of people. In London, some places, the fall is as high as 80 or 90 percent fall in the number of people dying in domestic fires. Why is that? Well, it's not primarily because we've got better fire engines. Um, and the public sector approach is um, we've, got a, we've got fire engines uh, and you've got this problem. Well, we could join the fire engines up and create a 24-7 one-stop shop service at the front of the fire engine. Maybe we could paint the fire engine blue and rebrand it. Uh, but basically, we've got fire engines. So whatever problem you've got, we've got fire engines. And I'm afraid we can't get out of the fire engines. And the fire engines are hospitals, schools, prisons, and other things. We run fire engines. We're experts in fire engines. You've got a problem, we'll send a fire engine. <laughs> But actually, what's happened with this is that the biggest change has come back through smoke alarms. If you can get more smoke alarms in more of the right houses, and what you have to do to get smoke alarms in houses, you have to spread out. You have to get them through, you know, um, kitchen manufacturers and tenants associations and landlords and um, through public education, and you need to make it really simple and mass and distributed. And so I think that you are great fire engine people and you need to be fire engine people because you've got powerful people you need to really take on and you need expertise, but you've also got to think smoke alarm. And a lot of our challenges are smoke alarm challenges. They're how do we get out there and enable people to find better solutions themselves with simple low cost ways of getting better results in their lives rather than relying us to fix it ex-ante. Think smoke alarm. Thank you. <laughs>